Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast with me, James Dixon, wishing you all a very good morning, afternoon or evening, whenever or wherever you tune in to our podcast from today. Um, and continuing a bit of a, a theme um, of, of some of our recent podcast episodes um, on the subject of diversity, inclusion, accessibility, all of those things, and, the, and there are sort of so many terms being being thrown around at the moment. Um, I, I don't think that there's as yet one sort of definitive way um, to banner it, nor should we necessarily, because I, I guess that's part of the whole topic of, of conversation. Um, joining me to sort of continue this theme that we've had on the podcast in recent episodes is Ryan Curtis Johnson. Ryan is the Director of Communications at an organisation called The Valuable 500. And on today's podcast, we're going to find out a little bit more about them and what their aims and what they're doing within the events industry. Ryan, welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast. Ah, oh, thank you for having me. It feels an honour to be asked. So uh, looking forward to having a conversation today. Well, uh, it's very, very kind of you to say an honour. You know, maybe your thoughts will change 10 minutes into this. <laughs> what is this ramshackle conversation we're having here? But no, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. And um, and no doubt, you, you know, you, uh, you would picking up on, on some of the stuff I said at the beginning of, uh, of the episode here. You know, we're, we're talking about diversity, inclusion, accessibility. There is no definitive term at, at, at the moment for, for, for what it is that we're going to be talking about today and what it is that the Valuable 500 was created and, is, and, is, and has set out to do. So yeah. let's just explain to our podcast listeners, first of all, what the Valuable 500 is. Yeah, of course. I just quickly, I'd just like to give an audio description of myself. So I'm a white man, oh, yeah. I'm sitting, sitting down. Behind me is a white background of a white wall. I'm wearing glasses. I've got a grey shirt on. Um, I've got short bl uh, brownish hair uh, and I'm sitting on a chair. Um, so just to, to give that audio description of myself. So, yeah, I guess really to... to to confirm and clarify who the Valuable 500 is. So the Valuable 500 is a global business collective made up of 500 CEOs uh, and their companies um, and innovating together for disability inclusion. We're the largest CEO network in the world. Well, I have to caveat that with a, a close second. We're actually second. Number one is obviously the UN, but I'm happy to, to say that we're second on, on that one. But uh, yeah, I like to say we're the first because it's primarily what we're doing. Um, all of these 500 CEOs and their companies have joined by making a commitment to action for disability inclusion. And now they're beginning to work together as a collective, so all of them, whether in silo groups, um, but as a collaborative approach to drive system change. Our founder, um, is Caroline Casey. Um, she likes to describe herself as an activist, but also a, a troublemaker as well. Um, she's registered blind as well, and really believes in the philosophy as if you can drive disability inclusion within the workplace, that will inevitably trickle out in society and we will see then change in inclusive, uh, you know, inclusion and what inclusion is all about. Um, one other thing just to, 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 to understand, we have, um, we're working with 15 global CEOs who are our iconic companies to co-create solutions which will transform the business system to be more inclusive with people with disabilities. And we've got three key areas that we're pushing out this year, which is um, inclusive reporting, which is C-suite stories, um, and also lastly, representation. And those are the three key areas that we're really trying to do uh, and, and look at. And obviously, to bring it back to why I think this conversation is great to have with you, is we are often asked to speak at many events, whether that's online, whether that's in person, and I think one of the key things that we're constantly um, standing by, which is something that I'm extremely proud of to be able to push back on, is that we do not participate in anything unless we know it's fully accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and if it isn't, we will then say no. And that's an important conversation to have because there are many things that often come up as to why something isn't being inclusive as such. Yeah. And, and historically, in the events industry, that comes down to budget. That, that comes down to co people say, oh, it's just <laughs> to do that, so we're not going to do it. That, that, unfortunately, we are in a, I say, unfortunately or fortunately, in terms of that particular argument and that particular um, pushback to certain elements, yeah. it, it, we are at a stage now where the, 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 the technology and what is available to us as event organisers has reached a stage where that argument is becoming 
more tenuous with every day that passes? I think 100%, but I also like to caveat back to the situation. So what we're saying is we're penalising someone because of their disability. Mm. So we're actually saying we don't want to serve you because we don't want to pay. And because of that, we're going to penalise you. But I also would say it's a real naive way of working because I think if we look at the way in which society works now, uh, probably like myself, you watch things on Netflix. I often watch things with subtitles because it's obviously in different languages and that's another way I like to interpret and, and watch programs. So we're growing up and evolving as a um, society and as humans to really in digest and take information in lots of different ways and I think phone devices were very much a part of that and technology has helped to support that situation but I think it's it's really interesting that actually there's some archaic um, mentality when it comes to thinking about how you know being fully accessible is within an organization or for your event and actually that it comes down to a cost because we just need to make it best practice not cost. Mm, absolutely. And, and just looking at, at the website, I mean, that the, these companies, you, you mentioned it's the Valuable 500, but you mentioned there are 15 globally recognised brands that are really working hard to sort of lead the way on this within the organisation. They are listed on your website, but I will just check yeah. that we mention just, just some of them, just to give people context, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. So some of our iconics are the London Stock Exchange, Deloitte, BBC, Google, Apple, EY, uh, Mahindra, um, Microsoft, P&G, Salesforce. I mean, they're, there's, they're the 15 of our iconics. We've got Sky and Sony as well. But yeah. then also we have other members that are not part of that iconics, but are still very important with Expedia. We've got British Airways um, and a variety of, you know, Lloyd's Banking Group, Sainsbury's, um, ITV. So there's a full for global brands as well as yeah. well so they're not just uk centric uh, and the, the reason I, I i sort of asked if it's okay to mention some of those brands is is really to sort of give give a bit of weight to the argument that when when businesses and organizations see brands like that addressing these issues and making concerted you know visible efforts um to change that that's often the driving factor in how you know, other businesses do it. You know, if the world's biggest brands are doing it, other brands soon will follow. Yeah, absolutely. And also as well, you know, it's the CEO who's got a wet signature to this. So he's the one who's committed or they are or she is the one who's committed to being able to push and drive this. Um, but it's also just trying to showcase of what is best practice. And that's what we're really trying to highlight here that um, I think going back to your first comment that you made, you know, there isn't a, a, a kind of title or, or name, you know, DEI is um, something that's very much utilised, but actually, disability is very much sometimes excluded from that um, yeah. or it's segregated out to something else so I think there's lots of conversations and what we always highlight is that many of our businesses are have either joined and they're on their own journey and doing their way of which and doing things and they do it differently but really sharing that ideology or best practice what's working for them how could that be utilized with others Microsoft have just done an amazing Microsoft Ability Summit, um, which our chief innovations officer was speaking at, talking about inclusive reporting. Um, and that's another great example of where, you know, they're really showcasing to drive good and talk about products and tech and things that are coming up. But also what's really lovely to see is what we're seeing in particular within the Valuable 500 is where brands, whether they are from the tech industry or the finance industry or the beauty industry, coming together to work on innovations to change that disability inclusion. And I think that's what's really beautiful to see as well. What, what I love about conversations like this is, is, is the learning that comes from it, the education that comes from it. Sometimes it can hit you hard, sometimes it's more subtle. And, and today yeah. something that's a little bit more subtle that, that, that I've immediately noted down um, was the audio description that you gave of yourself at the very beginning. Um, just something that as soon as you did it, I thought, of course. But had you not done it, I would never have thought to do that. And when I think to some of the events that I'm uh, part of the organising team for and on the production team for, we have conference panels, we have people sat on stages who are delivering sessions and topics of discussion. You know, um, how hard really would it be for in that context for for, for 
the chair to ask if there is anybody who is partially sighted in the audience, you know, you know, mm. or, or, or just by a matter of course, to ask those panelists to give a 10 second audio description of themselves before they dive into the to, to the actual start of the session. It's really not that difficult. But as soon as you did it straight away, I made a note of it. Yeah, I think it's really important to try not to put uh, the emphasis on the individual to come forward, because if we aren't constantly wait for that individual to come forward yeah. and disclose, maybe that person doesn't feel confident enough because they've obviously, you know, yes, not right. comfortable yes. enough to come out and work in in their own workplace, or they don't, or they they've had a bad experience when they have done it. So again, it's coming back to what's best practice. Well, if we just change that narrative slightly, and I hate this word with a passion, but it's the only word at the moment. So if you, if you do, James, come up with or know of any other words that I can help to change, normalising it. Because unfortunately, that's what makes this stand out is because it's not been normalised, so the request. But often as well, we shouldn't just look at this as being a disability inclusion requirement. It just makes it accessible for all. Because some people who prefer to, you know, maybe listen to something more than watch something or prefer to watch something with captions underneath rather than listen to something, it's also catering to tick and, and follow that process so that it works in lots of different ways. And actually, when you go back to technology and, and look at certain things, often the things that were created were not actually created for people without a disability. They were created for people with a disability, but people without disabilities have taken it on, like the TV remote and various other things like that. So there's, there's lots of different things that... I'm not saying we become naive to, but we don't really consider uh, of how actually that was never something that was just made as, um, you know, part of the programming or part of the product. It was actually encompassed and utilised based on it being more accessible. Yeah. And I think that's how we need to consider it. Uh, and, and there is there is a, an, an evolution taking place uh, and it, it has been slow, but I guess there's... A, I don't know about you. I feel like there's a sort of a, almost like a, an undercurrent of gathering momentum taking place. Yeah. Because you know, if, if you look just in our own sort of very niche world of event industry news and the podcast, I said that we've had this top topic of conversation several times in the last five or six months on this podcast. Now, if you look at how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of podcasts are available and how many media outlets and and places that people can get information from. It, it, you know, if we're having this conversation more frequently on this platform, then uh, it, it strikes me as that it's also taking place on other platforms and that will only help the messages gather momentum. And the more momentum there is, the more it becomes commonplace for us to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really key part of, of this. I think, let's be honest, sometimes it can be very fashionable, shall we say, for people to bring a conversation because everyone else is talking about it, so we want to get into that sphere. Mm. For us, really an important factor is inclusion means action. So it's less talk and more action. So really just trying to show. Um, so a lot, a lot of momentum is great, but actually where is the action? Where are we seeing that this is working? You know, to really break this down into a real simple terms, there's 1.3 billion people around the world living with a disability. Now that's just people with a disability. Once you start including extra, uh, so whether that's carers, whether that's parents and everything like that, you're looking at, you know, 17% of the population that will have and fit into this category. And I think what, what's really important to us is to see how that we're in, inevitably seeing change. And I think one for me is, you know, having worked in the events industry prior to this role for nearly 10 years, coming into this arena, I've learned so much, like you were saying, like little nuggets that you that, that happened at the start of this interview, but actually I've learned so much in really understanding and looking at things in a complete different light, because mm. obviously it was quite naive and um, quite ignorant actually of myself, and I'm, I'm happy to admit that, but actually coming into this sphere and this arena and understanding and the frustrations, it's really important to see how change really needs to change to make it better for all. It, it, I'm going to get on to, to uh, actual sort of advice, if you may, if, if you can call it that, and, and guidelines, because I've, I've no doubt there are people who are listening to today's podcast who work in, in the events industry who are thinking, OK, well, I think I know what I need to do. But is there an actual list? Is there something I can cross reference that, that maybe gives me some advice and opens my eyes to, to elements yeah. I 
hadn't considered before. Um, we'll get onto that in a minute, if I may, because uh, what I'd actually like to ask about is, is I'm going to term it hidden disabilities. You know, yeah. somebody who may be partially sighted or blind or yeah. part hearing or deaf or physically disabled. They may need crutches. They may need a wheelchair. You know, not all disabilities are necessarily visible or obvious to us as, as, as event organisers or in any sphere for that matter. Um, and it's something that we were talking about in a recent podcast I did with a gentleman called Robin Carlyle, who has been in the events industry for decades and ran a, a business called Mobile Promotions and has sort of fallen by accident into this subject because he's become a governor at a special educational needs school and has realized that there are a lot of young people out there with hidden disabilities autism you know um mental health issues that mean that sometimes they, that they respond badly to loud noises or to busy yeah. spaces and things like that and and part of this conversation it needs to sort of take place regarding hidden disabilities as well yeah, so we like to call it non-visible. Um, and we also, you know, what some of the, the key things that you were talking or key um, disabilities that you were listing there would come under the neuro neurodivergent. Um, so neurodiversity, which I think is a, a is is very much um one that's that's now at the forefront of people's minds because the requirements or the needs of that are slightly different um, in the sense of it, it doesn't need to sometimes be something physically that you see it's more an adaption or a requirement that you can see and do in slightly different ways and i think there are lots of things that i've seen within the events industry where they're actually trying to create more quiet rooms and you know more um, smaller spaces that people can take themselves away so that they can then you know give themselves some space to then come back in the room it's understanding you know what i always come back to is we as individuals can't be experts in everything so in some ways what i'm saying is stay in the lane that you know you know but go and get the person that is the expert and bring them into this conversation or in that planning stage because they know it and sometimes it's about paying the expert because you can't as an event organizer as whatever your role is within your organization be the expert for everything you know not even ceos are the expert on everything that's why they hire teams and people yeah. within organizations to be those areas so we think it's really important it's not a weakness and it's not like oh saying that you're not qualified to be able to then produce or, or deliver an event but bringing in those people that are those expertise and making sure that you know at then catering for um, a variety of disabilities, whether they're visible or non-visible, and actually understanding what those things are and, and then creating spaces and areas that those people feel safe and comfortable and that all their requirements have been met. Um, and that starts off the offset because let's be honest, unless you ask the question, you'll never know what those requirements could be. But also as well, it's just about having that already in place to be able to activate should that requirement be needed. Um, well, which we you raise a point there about asking questions. Is there, a, is there a reluctance on the part of businesses at the moment to ask the questions for fear of looking like they're either incompetent or not knowing what they're doing or worse, run the risk of, a, you know, causing offence to people? You know, it, it, do, do people need to be a bit more honest and just ask the questions knowing that it's better to do that than risk or, or not embarrassment is the wrong word, but I, yeah. I hope I'm conveying what I'm trying to ask you, which is... Yeah, no, you are. Is, I is, think is there a reluctance. I don't know if it's a reluctance. There is a nervousness, a hundred percent, because they don't want to get it wrong, and they don't they don't know possibly the best way to articulate it. So, what yeah. is the best way to ask of any requirements? So, I think sometimes it's about really keeping it plain and simple, in the sense of the same as you would ask for dietaries, or you would ask if someone would need accommodation. It's about asking: Is there any additional requirements you may need to enjoy this experience, or how can this experience be? But again. I would speak to experts that support in driving events. You know, Shani, who I was on a panel with recently at, um, at an event, she she's worked, she, she's very well established in she's just launching a massive um, event a internship for people with disabilities in the Midlands. Um, and she's worked at various different brands. Virgin Media O2 is where she works and, and drives a lot of things. And she says that it's about really providing a space. If people feel like you're trying to provide a space that is inclusive for all and accessible for all they're more willing to come forward or if you leave it off or you just ask a simple question is do you need anything else <laughs> it doesn't really feel like you really care 
So it's about really being caring and nurturing in that conversation with those individuals and allowing that space for that person to feel that they can disclose. But even more so, I think sometimes it's about putting things into place so that you know that actually it's already been delivered so that the onus isn't on that individual to come forward because there is that negative stereotype about coming forward sometimes in case it's a negative impact, especially in the workplace. You know, it feels like an element of non-progression. They don't feel like they can progress or they're well supported. And I think if you see that delivered in the communications that you're pushing out as a business, as a brand, as an event, you really then change that kind of momentum and that feeling towards feeling like you can really bring your whole self to work, shall we say. Uh, absolutely. And, and I, I mentioned um, uh, before we talked about the non-visible uh, disability. Yeah. As, as you you write it is the correct term um about sort of having an actual list or actual advice for people is 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 there such a thing at the moment has something manifested itself along those lines yeah there's a couple of things that we that we utilize that our director of events claire um, pushes out to organizations of here some of the key things that you should be doing when you're doing and hosting an event and the ways in which you can go about it. But also as well, within the Valuable 500, we have a directory. So we have a directory of suppliers. There's no bounce back or commission that we get on that. That these are people that are the experts in these areas that we can then align and push forward to the businesses that are part of the Valuable 500. Um, and it's, it's surprising how many people come forward and ask for those. Um, and then they can then support them in that journey and that process on all aspects. Um, and I think it's very hard to have a list because then are you then sort of conveying the message? Well, unless you fit within one of these categories, we're sort of doing, and as I was saying before, sometimes people who don't associate themselves as having a disability will want some of these accessibility elements because it's just the way in which they like to digest information or you know like to experience certain things when they're attending events. So I think it's very hard as much as we're sort of saying we want people to be able to feel like their needs are being met based on the disability they may have, there is also an element where it just makes it accessible for all, regardless of whether you actually disclose or come forward to have a disability. Well, well exactly. And as you said, you know, you don't have to be hard of hearing to necessarily benefit from seeing closed captions on a screen because it might yeah. just help you absorb and retain that information a little bit quicker and a little bit easier and in, in a bit more detail you don't necessarily yeah. have to have a disability to to benefit from some of the things that we're seeing taking place at events and being delivered at events particularly in, the, in this you know in in the specifics of this podcast it you know yeah. that those elements that we're deploying i think it, we're quickly realizing that they actually have wider implications and wider benefits yeah and also a person with a disability whether it's physical or non uh, whether it's visible or non-visible they could be coming with a carer or a support or, or someone who's coming with them who doesn't have any of those so although you're catering for that individual you, you also need to cater for that person that might be coming to them and that that also reflects in just everyday life as well so it's just sort of trying to get that balance right um, but really just making it part of it and the, the, the conversation and part of the process from the offset rather than an afterthought. And I think that's probably the biggest issue that you then do find. Mm. The, 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 the subject of, of sustainability is an important one and we've got to raise it whilst we've got you on today because it, it, we, we, we've been, I, I won't say hammering this message on the podcast, but um, it was brought to my attention on the podcast you know, many months ago that um, the conversation we're having about diversity, you know, uh, inclusion, um, accessibility in, in events particularly, ties in massively with the sustainability discussion as well that the events yeah. industry is having. And, and I've said it several times, so forgive me any regular listeners who go, oh, here he goes, he's going to say it. <laughs> we do need to get away from this thinking that sustainability is about recycling coffee cups and about not using carpet in in exhibition centers and about watching our carbon footprint and encouraging people to use public transport yes it's all of those things but yeah. the diversity inclusion the accessibility discussion that we're having today plays as big a part in the whole sustainability topic doesn't it ryan 
Yeah, exactly. It does. And basically, I think one of the key things about it is understanding that the SDGs, the Sustainability Development um, Goals that the UN push forward, will really also, you need to go and look at SDG 10. SDG, SDG 10 is inequalities. And the key here of what we're saying, I know you just talked about carpets in, a, in an event venue and, and all of that kind of being environmentally friendly. When you remove the carpets within an event space or in a conference center or whatever, you're actually making the acoustics a lot harder for a person who may have hearing or, you know, maybe um, needing to, you know, for that background noise. And that yeah. doesn't help. And so actually it's not just about being environmentally friendly, it's about the inequality qualities that that then caters for that individual and that individual's experience when they come into your event. The same as when it looks at screens and the visual elements of it, if you're not catering for something for those that maybe have, um, you know, could be blind or have visual uh, visual impairment, you, you're not really supporting any of those elements that that, that individual has, which means it's not, you know, inclusive. And it's not just about taking away that, the same as the screens, having an additional screens to put the captions on. You know, it's not doing that because, oh, we just want to have extra screens, but are you really looking at the colors and the formatting of how you're displaying this imagery, this text, this kind of design? Could you strip that back? And, you know, I always like to go back with this. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a cost saver myself. I like to save the pennies <laughs> where we can. Um, if you stripped back some of that additional costs that you did for production values or the goodie bag at the end of the day or the extra brownie or cake that you was going to have in the breakout, you know, <laughs> uh, lunchtime or tea time and utilize that money that you were going to spend on those individuals for doing, you know, live captioning or making your event inclusive, that would change a lot of things because actually that budget wouldn't come into it because does, you know, does anyone really realise that one less thing was in the goodie bag or that there was, there was four options of cakes Instead, you just change it to two options of cake. Uh, you, do you know what I mean? I think it's just trying to be smarter. But sustainable, uh, the sustainability side is, is about it being fair for all. And if we're not seeing that justice being done when we're thinking about it and we just remove things because one, well, that ticks that box, you're inevitably unticking another box within that. So... Another key point that I was talking about recently with someone is a lot of businesses align themselves to those SDGs and they say, you know, we fully support these, but actually they're not practicing what they're actually trying to preach there. And again, that comes back to what I'm trying to say here is inclusion means action. So we really need to push and drive that to to really sort of support that accessibility for all. Mm, it, it's uh, how far away are we realistically of it being a, a topic that is no longer a topic, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, because at, 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 at the moment, it, it, it uh, I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense in my own head, but you know, the, the, this no. is something that we're discussing almost as like a separate entity and a bolt on to the events that we're running already. Right, we now have to offer this element as well. Whereas yeah. hopefully, you know, in a few years' time, it will just become part of organising an event. I think we're starting to see elements of this with more mainstream side of things. So when you're going for concerts, we're seeing more signing being done with British Sign Language at, at different events or signing happening, even when we're seeing some of the correspondence. So last night, a great example, the pre-Oscar interviews was the first time they had someone who was signing directly next to the person who was being um, interviewed. Yeah. So when you say when are we going to see i think the momentum is there now because we have a generation now that are, they're not willing to sit down and just sort of say no they're coming forward they're challenging you know they're, they're really pushing forwards to see change and you know that that's occurring in all elements and when we look at the things that have occurred within the lifetimes that we're experiencing at the moment with black lives matter but more importantly yep. but not more importantly that that's an important factor but also most recently with the pandemic you know, a caveat to just go back to a lot of organisations, a lot of things, maybe even events where it couldn't happen online within 17 days. And that is right. Within 17 days, most yeah. businesses are online. 
exactly right. Now, what that did was that opened a door to more um, more talent within the disability uh, community. It also opened up their organisations to be more flexible and meet more needs of those that worked in their organisations. But also as well, events were open more to people from various different parts of the world who may also have been shielding as well during that period. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to understand that actually as much as some of these things have been horrific to see and watch, they have helped to just hurry things along a little bit. And I think it was, again, it's no longer fashionable to just say we're trying to be. It's more about actually seeing it. And I think a lot of that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and that was important to really see how that was being driven. Yeah. Uh, and I think out of any what can be deemed in the first instance as a negative situation or a bad situation or, a, you know, there will all a good will always come of it. You know, the good will yeah. happen. It, it will, that yeah. will that will always happen and, and with that uh, you know out of adversity comes you know development and and you know, that, 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 that's what happened you know e even something as simple as businesses who were completely vehemently against their staff working from home forced to yeah. do it overnight suddenly realizing actually this could be a good thing and and Absolutely. i suppose that, that that leads me on to sort of the, the the point i wanted to to maybe make is 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 the discussion that we're having about making events accessible and, and fully uh -huh. inclusive and accessible it, it is only going to be helped by a drive going back to the valuable 500 of these organizations and businesses as a whole making themselves more inclusive and having a more diverse workplace because some of the reasons why we're not catering appropriately at the moment within events is because we don't have an understanding of it if there was a more diverse workplace, we would naturally yeah. have a better understanding day to day of certain people's disabilities. And we had in hand with that, with our understanding would go to making our events more accessible. So that, that, that everything fits together. There is a missing element of data, unfortunately, with all of this. You know, a lot of organisations don't know how many people have a disability within their organisations. When we look at DEI, it often looks at diversity, equality and inclusion, but it actually sometimes really looks at more sort of gender and race. So disability is not always caveated into that. It's seen as a separate thing. Mm. We also can't have, a, you know, I am I'm stealing a quote here from our founder, Caroline Casey. It, we're not after the a la carte menu. We're after this being on the menus of all. You know, this can't be just, well, this year we're going to talk about this, this year we're going to talk about this, and this year we're going to focus on this. We actually just need it part of the mechanism and part of the process and part of, you know, normalising it. Again, that word that I really need another word for. So, you know, that's a shout out to your, to your listeners. <laughs> to, 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 think, <laughs> well, well, yeah, to normalise this so that it becomes part of the process and so that we're not having this conversation so that it is automatically thought of when planning an event so that we're not saying oh well we haven't got the budget for it we need two elements here we need the brands that the ones that are part of the valuable 500 and you can see all of the list of the brands we're more than 500 so that was the campaign element to get 500 organizations signed up we're we're over that now um but you can see them all on our website, you can search them. But more importantly, we need suppliers and agencies to lead the way in this. So that, you know, the same as, I think going back to your earlier point about sustainability and environmental, you know, a lot of people were getting the accreditations ISO 2012-1, which was obviously yep. showing that they were sustainable, leading on from the Olympic Games as well, because that was all part of it, you needed to be accredited to, to support that. I'm not saying we want to get to a point where we're having to audit whether you're being accessible, but if you're just trying to change that mechanism, be leading and say, right, we as a business now, we make all our events accessible and that comes. And that does mean some businesses may need to take the hit or you need to encompass that. But you know, deep down, morally, that's the right thing to do. And I think that's what we're trying to get across here. You know it's the right thing to do, regardless of the cost of what that looks at. Take the cost out. It's the right thing to do. 
Mm, absolutely. We've been um, we've been talking on the podcast today to Ryan Curtis Johnson, who is the director of communications for the Valuable Five Hundred. Um, before we sort of start wrapping things up on today's episode of the podcast, Ryan, um, really important that people know uh, how and where they can find more information on the Valuable Five Hundred. Um, maybe look into some of the stuff that you've talked about on today's episode. Um, tell our listeners where they can go and, and how they can find you. Yeah, so our website is very simple. It's uh, www.thevaluable500.com and it's uh, easily uh, able, uh, uh, easily navigated to find various information from white papers to articles and also as well, um, you can see a full list of the members that are part of The Valuable 500. We're on LinkedIn, The Valuable 500. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Um, we're just not on TikTok at the moment. I don't know whether that's something we will be considering. Um, but also as well we we're we're always here so you can you can contact us and we've got directory of people that we worked with as well which isn't shared on our website because that is for our members um but i always think that's a good way of if you are working with brands you know they're part of the valuable 500 it helps to engage this conversation even easier to look at how they are delivering on their event side of things um because their business has made a commitment Fabulous. Well, what, once again, um, for those who are who are watching and able to watch the uh, the video version of today's podcast on the eventindustrynews.com website, the website is on the screen now, the valuable 500, 500, 500, the valuable 500.com. Um, head over there and uh, I've, I've had a look through the website myself on a couple of occasions and as Ryan said very easy to navigate you should be able to find very very quickly and simply exactly what it is that you're looking for um, and uh, 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 so tying in a little bit with today's subject to sort of you know unashamed plug um, event sustainability live is the new live event that was launched by the team behind event tech live and of course event industry news announced a few weeks ago the uh, event sustainability live event will run alongside event tech live on the 15th and 16th of november uh, at excel london um, so two shows under one roof there and as we've mentioned on today's episode but also on several other recent editions of the podcast um, sustainability uh, is a subject that, that very much includes DEI and, uh, you know, we, all these sort of things that we've been talking about today, the accessibility, you know, closed captions, all of those sort of tools that are available to us now. You'll be able to see them all uh, being discussed and on display at Event Sustainability Live a little bit later on um, this year. Um, Ryan, thank you very much for taking time out of what is no doubt a busy schedule at the moment to have a little bit of a chat with us. And um, I, I hope genuinely that because we've had quite a number of these conversations and and different people from different backgrounds coming on and talking about this subject recently that people who listen to this podcast on a regular basis are hoping to start to piece together their own i suppose almost pool of resources of organizations that they now know are out there to support them um with this particular topic you know shout out to people like mira somji from clusivity who was on the podcast you know a, a few weeks ago you know organizations like that hopefully people who are listening to this and and what reading event is your news uh, regularly will be able to sort of maybe just pull their own resources together to maybe look at how they not necessarily tackle the subject maybe that's that's the wrong way of of putting it but approach it um going forward um and certainly oh, please yeah. do keep in touch we'd love to find out how things are developing on this subject you know data is is huge in the events industry and you know if you've got data and anything like that you'd like to share with us going forward please do come back on here and um let's keep the conversation rolling Amazing. No, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thanks to Ryan again today. Don't forget, eventindustrynews.com is where you need to go for the latest news, features, special supplements, all of that jazz. The A to Z supplier directory, of course, is on eventindustrynews.com as well, which brings us neatly, nicely to the end of today's episode. Our thanks once again to Ryan Curtis Johnson from The Valuable 500. My name is James Dixon. We'll see you next time on the Event Industry News podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.